Good morning, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us on today's webinar. Uh, my name is Ross Honig, and uh, thankfully I will not be doing the presentation. I'll be handing it over to our legal counsel, Ashley Gillihan. Uh, but before we do that, just a quick uh, couple of areas of housekeeping that I wanted to address. Uh, the first one is, is the presentation that Ashley will go over today. We will be emailing that out to all the attendees that do join in. Um, so feel free or don't worry, we'll be sending that out uh, sometime later this afternoon or tomorrow um, to all those that were registered on the webinar. The second area of housekeeping that I wanted to bring up is if anyone does have any questions during the webinar, you'll notice on that GoToWebinar widget, there is a section uh, titled Questions. Feel free to type in any questions that you have there. We're going to defer any questions that you have to the end of the presentation, at which point Ashley will go through those and uh, um, hopefully do his very best in getting all those answered while we're all on the call. Um, so without further ado, just a quick introduction to Ashley. Ashley Gillihan is a uh, attorney at the law firm Alston & Burt, um, where he's a member of the Employee Benefits and Executive Compensation and ERISA Litigation Group. Ashley focuses his practice exclusively on health and welfare employee benefit compliance and litigation issues for employers, health plan administrators, and other health and welfare benefit plan service providers. Uh, he has an extensive experience assisting financial institutions and insurance companies who serve as health savings accounts trustees or custodians. Um, so without further ado, Ashley, I will hand it over to you as we learn more about the new HRAs coming this January of 2020. Thank you, Great. everyone. Thanks. Thanks, Ross. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm male. My name throws people off, um, and oftentimes they spend a good, par good portion of the uh, webinar trying to figure that out. So I wanted to get that out of the way so there are no uh, unnecessary distractions. We have a very exciting topic, I think, for many of you today. Whether you like HRAs that reimburse premiums or not, it's still exciting because it is perhaps a new era uh, for us in the health benefit plan world. Um, so, And we're going to walk through the new final regulations issued by the agencies regarding HRAs. Um, as Ross said, we're going to have questions um, at the – we'll go over questions at the end, but please ask them as we go. Now, the way that I'm going to do this, I'm going to actually do a look back first. I think it's important to level set about HRAs, where we started, and how we got to where we are today and where we'll be in 2020. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on where we started, uh, but it is important, I think, to understand that point so that there's some context around where we are today. So let's start with the very beginning. Way back in 2002, the IRS issued Notice 2002-45. There has been guidance since then, but that's the uh, penultimate guidance. That sort of set the stage for HRAs, health reimbursement arrangements, which are employer-funded defined contribution reimbursement arrangements. Now, at that time in 2002-45, the specific arrangements addressed by the IRS and the arrangements that were giving them some pause for concerns had carryovers. Let me just make it clear as we move through today's session. The HRA term, the moniker, no longer relates solely to an employer-funded defined contribution arrangement that has a carryover. It's any employer-defined contribution arrangement, employer-funded defined contribution arrangement, not one solely with a carryover. Um, in the, you often see these terms MERP, uh, Medical Expense Reimbursement Plan, and while that's a legitimate term, to describe an HRA without a carryover, from an agency perspective, when we refer to HRA here today, we mean any. Um, but that's where it got its start, and there were a variety of rules and requirements applicable to an HRA. But the good news is they were permissible. Well, pre-ACA, you could have a standalone HRA. In other words, I as an employer could set up a, an employer-funded arrangement with a set amount that I would provide, and that HRA could exist absent any other traditional health coverage. In addition, you could even have a cafeteria 
plan that allowed employees to pay premiums for individual market premiums uh, with pre-tax salary reductions, and you could, through that HRA, pay premiums for individual market coverage. Um, and that's where we stood pre-ACA. You could have a standalone HRA that reimbursed regular garden variety 213D medical expenses. You could have a, a standalone HRA that reimbursed uh, just premiums for coverage purchased by employees in the individual market. Alternatively, you could even have an HRA, I mean a cafeteria plan, that allowed employees to pay all or a portion of their contribution for individual coverage with pre-tax salary reductions, and there were obviously different ways that could be done. There were some legal issues to these types of arrangements uh, in particular, and, and focused really heavily on arrangements that reimburse premiums for coverage in the individual market. One question is, well, will ERISA apply to the individual coverage. There was no question that ERISA would apply to the HRA that was actually providing the reimbursement or the payment for the premiums, um, or if it was a standalone HRA for 213D expenses, no question ERISA applied. But would it also extend to the individual policies being paid for by the employer? Remember, there's a safe harbor under ERISA for voluntary plans. Most of you on this call, I'm sure, are familiar with that. One element of that safe harbor is that the employer make no contributions whatsoever. And so there was some question about whether or not using an HRA to pay individual market premiums uh, would uh, cause ERISA to apply to those individual policies, which then would create administrative issues. It's important that we understand that because that's actually an element of something um, in the new guidance that we're going to talk about when we get to that. There were also issues regarding HIPAA non-discrimination rules. At that time, pre-ACA, as you know, in the individual market, carriers could underwrite. Um, frankly, they could do it in other areas as well, but certainly in the individual market, I didn't have to um, offer you a policy in the individual market if you had a pre-existing condition. Because of HIPAA, I had to in the group market, but in the individual market, I didn't. And since if this – if if – this arrangement that reimbursed premiums was subject to ERISA and the code, would that somehow run afoul of HIPAA's non-discrimination rules? And then also states, frankly, uh, simply did not permit or made it very difficult um, for carriers to align with employers or you all, brokers, uh, to sell individual policies to employees of an employer without complying with the small group market rules. And uh, I know California, for example, uh, there were others that just said, look, these are individual market policies, but when you do this to a group of them or you sell these to a group of employees, uh, we're going to make you make those policies be subject to small group market rules. And at that time, they just couldn't do it. Um, so a lot of issues still, but hey, we know under federal law, generally speaking, you could do that, right? So then comes the ACA, and this is going to be really the precursor of where we are today. The ACA came and passed the health insurance reforms, among other sections, uh, among other laws. But there were two provisions in the health insurance reforms that would have um, an impact on HRAs, the standalone 213D, the um, premium reimbursement arrangement, um, and even offering individual policies through the cafeteria plan, and that was Section 2711 and Section 2713 of the Public Health Service Act. The pr really, the crux of this is 2711, and that is you cannot have an annual dollar limit or a lifetime dollar limit on essential health benefits. Well, HRAs that reimburse essential health benefits would necessarily have an annual dollar limit because they are by definition a defined contribution arrangement. Um, well, 2013-54 came along and said, look, if you're going to have an HRA for active employees, it's going to have an HRA for active employees, it has to be integrated with group health coverage. 
In other words, you could no longer have a standalone 213 DHRA. You could no longer have an, a, a premium reimbursement HRA for individual market coverage. And 2013-54 went so far as to say, look, you can't even do a cafeteria plan where you're allowing employees to pay uh, for the coverage with pre-tax salary reductions because those are employer contributions. So we're going to treat that, uh, and they called it an employer payment plan, but again, we're referring to all of those as HRAs. They treated all of those as violations of this rule. Think about it. If you've got a 213D HRA, it's going to reimburse any and all general medical expenses. Many of those will, will qualify as essential health benefits, and if I'm limiting that, I've got uh, a, a potential violation. No question, I don't think many people disputed that. Interestingly, on the premium reimbursement arrangement, premiums obviously are not in the list of essential health benefits, but an HRA that reimburses premiums for an individual policy that actually pays for essential health benefits, the agencies treated that HRA as actually reimbursing essential health benefits. And so they said, look, the only way that, we're, that we'll allow this is if it's integrated with group coverage. And so here's what that meant when after 2013-54. No more individual coverage premium reimbursement HRAs for active employees. And that also meant no more Medicare premium reimbursement arrangements, even for employers with less than 20. Now, there were ultimately two exceptions to that as the guidance went along, and we'll talk a little bit about those. That's essentially what that meant. And no more ICE, uh, individual coverage offered through a cafeteria plan. No more 213D HRAs for active employees that were not limited to group health plan participants. That's what that meant. That's where we – that's – after the ACA, that's the landscape for HRAs. Very important we understand that because we're going to move into where we'll be in 2020. Um, a lot of people were up in arms, especially small employers and those that service small employers. Um, because the HRA that reimbursed premiums for coverage in the individual market was often a, uh, a means by which small employers provided coverage to employees. And so Congress actually passed QSERAs, uh, Qualified Small Employer Health Reimbursement Arrangements, for employers who did not qualify as applicable large employers. They had less than 50 full-time employees in the, in the preceding calendar year. These had significant limitations to it, though. Um, again, only applicable to non-applicable large employers. No employer in the control group could offer any other group health coverage of any kind. You couldn't even offer a health FSA um, if you were going to offer a QSERA. Reimbursement was capped at statutory adjusted maximums. Um, COBRA did not apply. That's good news. Um, but the other provisions of ERISA did apply to the HRA, and it had to be offered to all employees on the same terms with certain exceptions, and a notice was required. So I, this, frankly, in, in my world, QSERAs were, were not particularly popular. Now, that's in my world, that includes – uh, medium to very large size employers and a slew of TPAs uh, of all varieties. They just didn't – I didn't get many questions about these, and as, as best I could tell, they weren't being offered uh, frequently, uh, but I know that they were, but it was an option that was available. So here's, here's, here's where we are today after the dust settled and before the, the final regulations. So today – Here's what we have. We have a standalone retiree HRA. That's an HRA that has less than two active employees enrolled in the plan on the first day of the plan year. You can do anything you want with that. That is not subject to the health insurance reforms that uh, created the problems addressed by Notice 2013-54. So anything we're talking about today, ignore an HRA only for retirees because none of that applies. You could have an HRA that provided only accepted benefits. Remember, the health insurance reforms weren't applicable to accepted benefits. And so you could have an HRA that provided dental only or dental and vision or vision only. You could have one that reimbursed Medicare supplemental premiums, provided you didn't run afoul of the Medicare secondary payor rules. 
And of course, you could have a health FSA. That's an accepted benefit. And you could have an HRA integrated with group health plan coverage. You could have an HRA integrated with group health coverage for active employees. And you could have a QSERA. There were two instances in which you could actually still deem to be integrated for these purposes with if you were integrated with Medicare. Um, and it was a very limited exception. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on that today because the new rules – significantly open that up, and that's what I want to focus on. But that, this is where we are right now um, at this very moment. Now what we want to do is talk about where we're going and what 2020 is going to look again. So the Trump administration came in, kind of stirred the dust again. Um, executive order, and a little play on political slogans here, uh, was issued by the Trump administration that said, hey, or by, by the Trump office and said, hey, agencies, go and make HRAs great again. Um, so they first issued the proposed regulations that form the foundation for the final regs we're going to discuss today. And those regs created two new HRAs in addition to those that we just discussed, you know, the, the slide that had the ACA after the dust settled. These are two new ones. None of the others have gone away. They're still there. These are two new ones. Well, the final regulations have now been issued that provide sort of the uh, the final parameters on those two, and that's what we're going to spend the rest of our time focusing on here today. Oops. All right. So I said two arrangements. I'm actually calling it two and a half um, because we have what I'll refer to today as ICRA or an individual coverage HRA. And then with that, you actually can offer a supplemental cafeteria plan, and that's my half arrangement. Um, and I'll talk more about what that is. It's very limited, but I think could be viewed as very beneficial. And then there's also what we call the accepted benefit HRA. And this is basically a stand uh, – not a standalone, I shouldn't say, but it, it's a non-integrated HRA for actives that reimburses general medical expenses up to a certain point. Um, so it's kind of an exception from the integrated HRA for active rule, um, but it's it's limited, and we're going to talk about how you set that up. None of this is effective until plan years beginning on or after January 1, 2020, but that's rapidly approaching. Guys, it's July 11th, so that's coming up. Unlike the QSERAs, these are available to employers of all sizes. There is no limitation you, do, you could be an applicable large employer and still use one or both of these in some form or fashion, or you could be a small employer. Um, it doesn't matter. It's open to all employers. And unlike QSERAs, employers can offer traditional group health coverage to some classes of employees, and an ICRA or an uh, accepted benefit HRA to, to others. And that gives employers some flexibility. Now, I know the folks on this phone are, are predominantly or are exclusively advisors to employers, and this is trying to keep up with the variations that are permissible, and, and those that aren't uh, will be a challenge, and we're going to set the stage for alleviating that challenge here today, but definitely going to be able uh, – this is definitely a value add for employers who are really trying to figure out, well, we have traditional coverage, but what can we do or we don't? Uh, what can we do with these? What value will these provide and to which employees? And we're going to try and answer some of those here today as best we can. Um, employers can offer all employees in NICRA. There's no requirement here that I offer traditional coverage. So you might see especially smaller employers, um, and I actually expect maybe perhaps – and again, we'll talk more about this. Employers who were applicable large employers but had not traditionally provided health coverage, um, who got pushed into that arena through the employer shared responsibility rules, might find these ICRAs relatively attractive. We'll see. I don't know. Um, but what you can't do is offer the same class of employees an ICRA and also an accepted benefit HRA. You're going to have to figure out. Um, which of these that you do. So again, that's just a high level overview. Let's let's get into a few more details. We're going to start with the ICRA. And the way I've broken this out is I've got plan design requirements, administrative requirements, and some legal nuances so that we can first focus on how this thing will look. And then we're going to 
look at it, how it might work in operation. And then we're going to look at some legal challenges uh, that you have to consider as you go into these. So let's start first with the plan design requirements. So if you're going to establish a NIC, remember, you don't, there's no size limitation for the employer. So this is available to any employer who's interested in this. But employees must be enrolled. The plan is limited to, is another way to say that, to employees enrolled in either individual market major medical coverage, and that's a pretty broad list, grandmothered, grandfathered, student insurance could be exchange, off exchange, doesn't matter, any individual major medical market coverage, or Medicare. Now, let's hit the pause button for a second because this is going to be very important. The preamble to the regulations went in great length about uh, the application of the Medicare secondary payer rules um, and to, to these types of arrangements and just the Medicare rules in general and how Medicare prohibits the sale of an individual insurance policy to a Medicare beneficiary and how this was um, – and because of the way these rules are set up and having to offer the coverage to everyone in a particular class, which might include – uh, Medicare beneficiaries, in order to level the playing field, in order to make sure there would be no uh, discrimination, they ultimately decided, look, it's, it, it, there, you have to allow them if, – if I'm in a class being offered an ICRA, full-time employee, part-time, we'll talk about the classes in a minute, and I, the only coverage I can actually get is Medicare, then you have to treat me as eligible. You can't – so Medicare has to be one of the options that I can be enrolled in in order to be eligible for this coverage. So it's going to be either individual major medical coverage or Medicare. Again, and that's irrespective of the size of the employer. If I've got 100 employees and I'm offering this to – all my full-time employees, I do not run afoul of the Medicare secondary payer rules. If I offer this and only this to that class, including the Medicare beneficiaries in this class, I want that to sink in for a minute because I know when we've done the annual conferences uh, for, for OCA, a lot of questions are raised about, gee, what can I do with Medicare? This, is gonna, this kind of arrangement is going to open this up. So I want you to kind of keep that in the back of your mind, especially if you've been very interested in that in the past. But fundamentally, everybody eligible for this, to, everybody to whom you're offering this to, has to be enrolled. They can only be eligible if they have individual major medical coverage, and that includes dependents, or they're enrolled in Medicare. All right. Secondly, the employer, the plan has to establish a process to verify my enrollment and my dependence enrollment in individual coverage. Now, this is important, guys, because it's going to create um, an administrative component to HRAs that we don't typically have. Um, it's going to create an enrollment period. I have to verify – so let's assume I'm going to offer it to all my full-time employees. I have to verify prior to the start of the plan year that you have individual coverage or Medicare. And I'm just going to refer to those two generally as individual coverage. I know Medicare is not – it's really neither individual market or group, but I'm going to refer to it as just individual coverage so we don't have to – say both. But I have to verify that you have individual coverage, and there's ways that you can do that. You could go so far as to require proof, a document from the, the third-party provider, um, or you could just obtain attestation from the employee regarding the employee and the dependents. Now, there's a lot of question about how you go about that attestation. There are model notices that have been provided, and the model notices have a number of elements on it, including but not limited to identifying those dependents and identifying who the insurance carrier is or the health care provider is in that particular instance. Um, but the good news is I don't have to track down the, the policy that's being provided or I can rely on attestation. But you're going to do that before the start of the plan year. And for newly eligible employees, you're going to do it before the first day of coverage, before coverage starts. Then – you're going to require this ver – you're going to do this verification every time a request for reimbursement is made. 
That could be part of the form that's provided. Um, could be, um, and what well, would be part of the form, you could also have a separate form um, that's just an attestation. Now, let me hit the pause button because I know this question is going to come up. What about debit cards? I swipe my debit card at the point of sale. I'm not actually submitting a paper form. Can I do the attestation through the debit card? Well, you know today we do put something on the card per the IRS rules that says, hey, you're only going to – I will only use this card or this card's only available for medical expenses. And by using this, I certify that I'm not using it for something that's not medical care. The question is can you do something similar uh, for these ICRAs? Um, with regard to this enrollment verification, and the answer is unknown at this point. Um, my personal view, not legal advice, but my personal view is that you can, um, provided that you've made it very clear in the materials that you're going to provide, and we'll talk about that, um, that uh, that is indeed what you're doing when you swipe that card, that that card actually has language on it that says this is what you're doing when you swipe this card, um, and that imposes obligations on the employee uh, to provide additional information should any of that no longer be true. Now, whether that is how the IRS and the agencies view this, I don't know. Um, that's not been addressed. Um, but as high level, we know that attestation works at that particular time. Now, don't think you're – this is the other thing I get tickled about because I've gotten questions about it. Okay, well, is that the only substantiation that's required? No. If I submit a request for reimbursement, the same substantiation rules that we have today, the ones that we fight and quibble over um, you know, what has to be provided, all of that still applies. So there's really two things going on when I submit a request for reimbursement. I'm first verifying that I am still covered – by the appropriate IC, the individual coverage, or, and or my dependents are if I'm submitting a request for reimbursement for them. And I'm also having to substantiate that expense that, that I've incurred, and we'll talk about the scope of expenses here in just a minute. Um, all right, so that's so, – so now we know who – generally, the employees have to have IC coverage. I have to verify that. Now let's talk about who, which employees I can actually offer this to. So generally speaking, I have limited ability to, to, to vary what I offer in an ICRA within a quote-unquote class. But I have a lot of flexibility to, to vary the ICRA or not offer it at all among classes. Okay, Let me say that one more time. I have limited ability to vary the terms of my ICRA within a class, and classes are defined. We're going to go over those. But I have a lot of flexibility to vary the terms of an ICRA among classes. Very important. Um, the only variations that I am permitted within a class are age, and that's the three-to-one ratio that we have in the individual market, family size, and, and this is extremely important. High deductible health plan HSA eligibility, and that's going to be very important where you are reimbursing medical expenses because think about it. Ross and I are full-time employees of OCA. OCA offers a HICRA to all full-time employees. Obviously, that's a class. We're going to talk more about what the others are in a minute. But I have enrolled in a qualifying high deductible health plan. Ross has enrolled in a low deductible health plan. All things being equal, it would not – it would run afoul of this same term requirement if you chose not to reimburse expenses for me or if you had a, a version for me that said we're not going to reimburse expenses for you until you've satisfied that high deductible, um, and we're going to reimburse Ross's expenses first dollar. Um, you couldn't do that. The final rules, unlike the proposed rules, which didn't address this, say it's not a violation of this same term rule if you say, hey, within this class, we'll reimburse high deductible health plan expenses in accordance with the 223 rules. And for those that don't have a high deductible health plan, we'll reimburse first dollar. That's okay. You can do that. Um, so that's good news. Gives a lot of flexibility. And again, as I said, no very limited variation within a class, but you can vary it among classes. 
Another important feature of this is that the class to whom I offer an ICRA, I cannot offer any other traditional group health coverage or an accepted benefit HRA. So I can't say, OCA couldn't say to me in the example I just gave, hey, you have a choice. You can elect major medical coverage or we'll give you this ICRA. I have to categorically be, Ross and I would have to categorically be excluded from the traditional group health plan if one was offered. But hey, that's the actually a key difference between this arrangement and the QSERA. If, I, if OCA were offering us a QSERA, couldn't even have the option to offer a group health plan, a traditional group health plan to us. But now the employer can still offer traditional group health coverage, just not to the class eligible for that ICRA. Um, but you can offer accept, other accepted benefit arrangements. So I could offer you an ICRA and a health FSA. I could offer you an ICRA and a limited scope dental or vision plan. Hopefully at this point, you're kind of starting to see, wow, there's a lot to this, a lot of different variations. Once you get those variations down, once you get the limitations on those variations down, you can start to see what all it is you can actually do here. Uh, I have frozen up. There we go. Oh, man, now I've gone too far. Okay. Ah, sorry, guys. Hang on. Let me get back here. All right, so what are the classes? Each of these reflects a separate and distinct class. Full-time, part-time, salaried, non-salaried, or hourly, for lack of a better description. Employees subject to a CBA. Employees in the same rating area as defined by the ACA. Employees hired by employer to provide services to other employers, a temp agency, if you will. So, for example, if I'm a temp agency, I have my own full-time employees who provide services only to me, and then I hire people. They're my common law employees, but I provide them to other employers, provide services for the other employer. In that case, I can treat that temp class as a separate and independent class. And I also can set this up for those who have not yet satisfied a waiting period. Um, again, I cannot be enrolled. This, I have to be enrolled in individual major medical coverage or Medicare. Um, those have very, usually very, very low, very, very short, if any, waiting periods at all. So it remains to be seen how that exactly would work. But I might have individual medical coverage and I'm waiting 90 days to get into a group plan. Um, perhaps that would work. There, there's a lot there to, uh, to take in. I also can combine any two or more of the classes to form a class. I could do full-time employees in a rating area, for example. I could do uh, full-time hourly employees. So there's a lot you can do there, but here's the important part to keep in mind. Once you know the classes and you, can, and you set those up, I can offer an ICRA to that class. It has to be on the same terms to everyone in that class, but for those limited variations, I said. But I'm not entitled to offer the same thing to another class. I could offer my full-time employees in um, New Jersey a traditional group health plan, and I could offer an ICRA to my full-time employees in Alabama and not run afoul of these rules because those are two separate and distinct classes. Yes, they're both full-time employees, but they're full-time employees in two different rating areas. So you see how this works? There's going to be a lot of thought required for these, but that actually kind of makes these fun. There is a minimum class requirement um, in certain circumstances. So if you do, as an employer, offer traditional health coverage to some employees and an ICRA to others, then there's going to be potentially a minimum class size requirement. It's only for full-time, part-time, hourly, salaried, and employees in a particular rating area. And then only where only in certain situations with respect to those employees. So for example, if I'm offering um, uh, an ICRA to full-time employees, I'm sorry, traditional to full-time employees and an ICRA to part-time employees, then I'm gonna have a minimum class size requirement with respect to the part-time employees to whom I'm offering that ICRA. Um, not gonna get into a ton of details today. I know in advance of this, we talked a little bit about some questions that folks might have, and and one of them was, well, gee, I got an employer with 10 employees. Uh, do I have some sort of minimum class size requirement? Because as you'll see in the next slide, you know, 
I have to have a minimum class size of 10 where the minimum class size rules apply. Well, if I'm an employer with only 10 employees and I'm interested in ICRA, then I'm likely not going to offer traditional health covers to my employees. And if that's the case, then there's no minimum class size requirement. If I offered traditional health coverage to my to some of my employees, I wouldn't be able to satisfy that class size requirement at that size level. Um, again, just another nuance that requires you to think through this for the employer who's interested. All right, what's the scope of permissible reimbursement? Well, uh, pretty broad. Any IC individual coverage and or Medicare premiums, no group premiums. So you've got individual coverage and you've got Medicare premiums are eligible for reimbursement and or 213D medical expenses. Now, you don't have to offer the full Monty of 213D medical expenses. You could limit that. But whatever limitation you provide or that you impose has to apply to everyone within the class. Um, you can't say for some full-time employees it's limited to this, to others it's limited to that. Um, and you don't have to reimburse premiums. You can do just 213D medical expenses, um, or you could do just premiums. Um, so you, you have some uh, flexibility there. And, of course, we've already talked about the substantiation requirements and uh, the debit card. You also – now we're going to get into the administrative requirements. So you have to provide a QSERA-like notice, and this has to be provided 90 days before the start of the plan year, except if you implement a plan prior to January 1, 2020, then you don't have the 90-day rule doesn't work. You have to do it you know, uh, uh, prior to the start of the plan year. Um, for new, newly eligible employees, it has to be provided prior to the start of coverage. So I think what's going to happen here, folks, is that – you're not going to have a date of hire coverage date. Otherwise, you're going to be handing employees this notice um, on the date they're hired. You're probably going to have first of the following month, and that's okay. You can do that. Um, you can have a waiting period up to 90 days. Um, that's not going to be a problem. So um, you also have to allow employees to opt out permanently for the plan year. Now, why is that? Well, that's actually a part and parcel of the integration rule today, and here's why. And, and we're going to talk more about this in just a few minutes. The HRA itself is minimum essential coverage. It's not an accepted benefit, um, and that's true whether it reimburses just premiums or it reimburses 213D medical expenses. It's minimum essential coverage, and I am disqualified from a subsidy in the exchange if I'm enrolled in um, minimum essential coverage, irrespective of whether it's affordable or provides minimum value. Just the fact that it's minimum essential coverage is enough to disqualify me. So you have to give employees the option to opt out and dependents the option to opt out permanently because a dependent who could be eligible for reimbursement under that ICRA could be disqualified. Here's the rub, and this is where, guys, we're going to have to be uh, diligent in our communications. If the ICRA coverage is affordable, then it necessarily provides minimum value. That's how this rule works because all individual coverage, whether it be major medical market uh, – individual market coverage or Medicare, provides minimum value. So if it's affordable, it won't matter whether they opt out or not. It, they'll be disqualified, and that's part, part of what goes into the notice that we talked about a few minutes ago. This, you'll tell them, hey, if this is affordable and you opt out, you're still disqualified, and you're going to give them the rule, which I'm going to talk about in just a minute on what's affordable. Now, here's <laughs> trying to determine whether or not the coverage you've been offered by your employer is affordable is going to be a challenge, I think, for the average employee. Um, frankly, it may be a challenge for any employee, um, but certainly it's going to be a challenge for, for – the, the garden variety employee, maybe not the MIT engineer, but it's, it's not going to be easy to figure out, and there's going to be a lot of confusion. Um, so that's going to be an area where we'll have to be diligent in the communications, um, but that's why you have to give them an opt-out. Now, the HRA itself is subject to ERISA unless you're a governmental employer or a church plan, and that means in addition to this notice, you have to have a summary plan description. You'll have to file a 5500 if you don't otherwise qualify for an exemption. 
here's the interesting part. I focused earlier on when we were talking, when we were doing our look back about one of the legal issues that we previously had with premium reimbursement HRAs is the extent to which that individual policy would be subject to ERISA if it was being paid for by the employer. Well, the Department of Labor has issued sub additional guidance here, and what, here's what they've said. There's a safe harbor unique to ICRAs. ERISA will not extend to the individual policies that are being paid for by the employer, despite the existing voluntary plan safe harbor, provided that there is no endorsement at all by the employer. So any notion of having a private exchange uh, for these types of arrangements will be somewhat uh, undercut by this safe harbor because if I they what they're basically saying is hey if you don't meet the safe harbor ERISA is going to apply to those individual policies um, and so the question I get here is well gee what if we hire a broker or a third party to assist our employees um, with looking for coverage is that too much I don't think that is I think that's an opportunity here um, to help without running afoul of that rule provided that I, the employer, am not hiring someone who's going to limit the scope of assistance. Hey, we're only going to look at these particular policies. Um, instead, you'd be hiring someone to help employees look for all available coverages in the individual market. And if you're doing that, then I think you're okay. Anything beyond that, I think you're stepping very near, if not over, the line. Um, you also still – the HRA is not an accepted benefit, so it's still subject to other – um, ACA health insurance reform requirements to the extent not satisfied by um, the policy. So, for example, an SBC, summary of benefits and coverage, will still have to be issued. Um, and so that's an administrative hassle, I know, but it applies. Let's talk about some of the other uh, legal nuances. I just talked about the safe harbor RISA exception. Um, there's also a, a 105H exception that the IRS has uh, – only begun to address. I think we're going to wait for additional guidance. But basically, if you know, as you all know, we've talked about this a million times. If you've been to any of the OCA conferences, um, 105H has two eligibility tests: has an eligibility, uh, has two non-discrimination tests that prohibits discrimination in favor of HCEs, an eligibility test, and also a benefits test. Well, the nature of the rules and the requirement that I offer. Uh, the s coverage to the s on the same terms to a class, but not necessarily another class, um, on its face would suggest that, hey, these rules actually perpetuate a discriminatory design. Because remember, under 105H benefits test, if one HCE gets a benefit that's better than what all other non-HCEs receive, it's discriminatory with respect to that HCE. Well, what the safe harbor will likely say is – if you meet the requirements of the ICRA rules that we're talking about today, then there is a safe harbor from the benefits discrimination test. In other words, you're okay there. Um, unclear about how that would apply, if at all, to the eligibility test, and so I think there's some, still some work to be done on that. But that's good news because it gives us a chance to set these up without having to worry about that. Now, what's also interesting is that 105H has, for the last 40 years, included a premium reimbursement only exception. So if your ICRA reimburses only premiums, well, you don't have a you, – you never did, even without the safe harbor, have a, a 105H issue. So this really is for those arrangements that reimburse medical expenses. And also, in order to facilitate these, they added two new special enrollment periods. For employers, employees of employers who are just now putting in a um, uh, ICRA and employees who become newly eligible for one. So that's going to facilitate getting into the market. Now let me hit the pause button for just one second because Ross and I were talking about this before the call got started. Um, unclear what will happen if the ACA is ultimately held to be unconstitutional. As you know, the Northern District of Texas has held that it was unconstitutional on the exact same analysis, and uh, that was used by Justice Roberts to uphold the ACA as a tax. Um, 
Justice Roberts said, you know, look, uh, it was it's not a valid exercise of the Commerce Clause to impose uh, a requirement to have insurance on um, individuals at the federal level. Um, but the federal government does have the ability to impose a tax, and despite it being called a penalty, the individual mandate is in fact a tax. Well, as you know, the individual mandate tax has been eliminated. The requirement to have coverage is still there. Now, this was very clever of Congress. I don't think people thought uh, that – maybe thought that this was intentional, and it was – the way this came about had to come about because of certain limitations in the lawmaking process, but the – the actual mandate still exists. It just there's no teeth to it because there's no tax associated with it if you don't have coverage. Well, the Northern District of Texas said, "Well, look, we're just going to take Justice Roberts' reasoning and go look. If the tax is gone, then all you're doing now is imposing an obligation to have coverage. That's not a valid exercise of of, of federal law. It's not a valid exercise of commerce clause, and there's nothing else that would permit it. So that's unconstitutional. And if that's gone." Everything else that's in the ACA is is gone because it's all tied to that individual mandate. This circuit arguments last week, and actually earlier this week, became very apparent that the justices on the bench there seem to be leaning towards agreeing with the lower court, which means this is definitely headed to the Supreme Court. Frankly, it's headed there regardless. But if all that goes away, what happens? Is it, will it still – will it then again be difficult to get individual market coverage? Will it undercut these arrangements? I don't think so, but the reason I don't think so is because I believe that if that happens, if the ACA is determined to be unconstitutional and the ACA goes away, states will still adopt reforms on insurance similar to what we have today in order to, um, I guess, prevent – you know commercial catastrophe. I don't know what you'd call that. but So I don't know that that will ultimately have an effect, but it's definitely interesting times. All right. Um, as I noted earlier, the ICRA is, M is minimum essential coverage, and it can also be affordable and provide minimum value. Here's why that's important. Remember, unlike QSERAs, this is available to all employers. Applicable large employers could actually use a HICRA that's affordable to satisfy the A penalty, the sledgehammer penalty, and the B penalty. Um, whether or not it's affordable is another matter altogether. And of course, they're un in the pr premium tax credit rules, so the one that the states would apply, the state exchanges, it's, a, it's one formula. F employers under the employer shared responsibility rules can still use the affordability safe harbor. So it's. It Trying to determine whether it's going to be affordable or not is a challenging issue, but that opportunity is there. All right, let me uh, quickly move into the last couple of bits here. So I noticed – I told you earlier this was two and a half new designs, and this is the half. They also said, look, despite 2013-54, we'll let you have a cafeteria plan that allows employees to pay the difference on that individual coverage. That's not paid for by the ICRA with pre-tax salary reductions, so it's necessarily connected with the ICRA. You still cannot have a cafeteria plan that's not connected with an ICRA that allows employees to pay individual market major medical coverage with pre-tax salary reduction. Now, of course, you could individual dental or vision, um, but not major medical coverage, only in connection with the ICRA, and it does not apply to the exchange policies. So if I'm enrolled in exchange policy, then that opportunity to pay the difference with pre-tax dollars does, does not apply. Also, one other real quick thing before I get into this last uh, bit, because this one's actually quite simple and easy. Um, unlike the QSERA, which allowed you to be in the QSERA and still have a subsidy for your exchange coverage, this is an all-or-nothing deal. If I'm enrolled in an, in, uh, an ECRA, I'm out on the subsidy in the exchange. Just cannot, I'm not eligible for it at all, and so that's, a, that's another – difference between those two, um, frankly, for me, I believe the QSERA is far, far inferior to these because I have so much more flexibility with an ICRA than I do a QSERA, but that's, uh, I guess, probably going to be a personal view. Let me go into the last piece here, the accepted benefit um, HRA. So 
in addition to this ICRA, which, go, which also has a supplemental cafeteria plan possibility, we also can set up an accepted benefit HRA. And this is what I would call a non-integrated 213D HRA. So here's what it means. Every employee to whom you offer this to has to also be offered traditional health coverage. They don't have to enroll in it, but they have to be offered it. And that's why I'm hesitant to call it a standalone because it's really not. I have to be eligible for the employer's group health plan. This is the exact same rule we have in the health FSA world. A health FSA is not an accepted benefit if you're not giving me the opportunity to also enroll in uh, in your traditional health coverage. Um, so have to be offered coverage, but you can offer alongside that other accepted benefits. I could have an accepted benefit HRA that also is offered uh, where I'm offered – a limited purpose dental or vision. Um, I could also be offered a, a health FSA, but you cannot also offer me a NICRA. And the reason is you can't offer someone eligible for a NICRA group health coverage, and that's a fundamental requirement of the accepted benefit HRA. The reimbursement under this is limited each year to 1800 That's adjusted each year for inflation, and you can carry over amounts. That does not apply to the $1,800 limit has to be made available to all similarly situated employees. Now, the question I'm getting is, well, how does that differ from the class or the classes for ICRA purposes? Well, not much. Um, similarly situated is based on bona fide employment classifications, um, and it would be hard. I'm sure you could, but it would be hard to find classes of employees that were similarly situated that were different from what you have available. I think what will happen ultimately, practically, perhaps legally, is that what you have in terms of classes for ICRA will be what you'd use for this, uh, but they don't use the same terminology. Um, and reimbursement is limited to 213D medical. That could be dental, vision, um, but it, it, it does not include premiums except for COBRA or other continuation coverage and also short-term limited duration insurance, um, but that's it. So that's uh, that gives employers some um, a different option, and we have some administrative obligations that go with this. Obviously, ERISA, COBRA. COBRA applies to the HRA for the ICRA as well. It also is going to apply here. There's no 105H exception for this, and this is an accepted benefit. So unlike the ICRA, this is not going to help you get out of any penalties um, under the employer shared responsibility rule. Now, let me go to this last point, and then I will take whatever questions you may have. So now what? Okay, what happens 1-1-2020? Well, frankly, it's going to happen before then because we're going to have to digest all of this. And I expect that we'll have an FAQ from the agencies um, that'll be, you know, 4,812 FAQs, um, like the QSERA FAQs were, it was 79 pages of, of FAQs. Um, so I think there's more to come, but we have to start digesting this now because employers in 2020 may want to offer this. They're certainly going to be asking about it. I told Ross before we started this call, I'm actually, I actually have large employer clients asking me about this, not necessarily because they're super interested in it, but they're curious as to what options it might provide them. So you have to ask which employers are going to be interested in the ICRA, which are going to be interested in the accepted benefit HRA, which are going to be interested in both, right? I don't know who that is yet. I think there are some possible categories of employers that would be interested. Um, certainly applicable large employers who offered coverage for the first time uh, to anyone because the employer shared responsibility rule might be interested in this because of its ability to help you avoid those penalties or at least mitigate them uh, under the employer shared responsibility rule. Employers who had always offered coverage but had not offered coverage to, to, to fringe workers, if you will, part-time employees, um, you could offer it this to them and, and, and maybe become more competitive. I, I don't know. That all remains to be seen. Um, but we'll have to figure that out, and you'll have to figure that out with respect to your clients. Which employees of interested employers interested in these accounts would, would benefit? Again, I don't, I don't know the answer to that yet. I think that will remain to be seen. Um, and when will interested employers be interested? Are they going to be interested 1-1-2020? Is this going to be down the road? I think that this is probably – I think you'd uh, – it's July of 2019. 
2020 is probably set in terms of plan design for the most part, um, especially for those that currently offer coverage. So probably not 2020 for those. I Obviously, there'll be exceptions to that, but I, I suspect that's a pretty accurate guess. Those that don't offer coverage at all, hey, or, or they're going to offer coverage for the first time to, to groups who are in classes here, um, they might be interested in that. So I think there's a lot that remains to be seen. I've thrown out a lot to you in an hour. I probably could have done this in two hours. But hopefully you get the gist of, of, how, um, of, of how these work. Who, who can offer them? To whom can they be offered? What are the design requirements? So with that, Ross, let me open it up, and, and we'll answer any questions that we have. I'm happy to go a little past 12 o'clock. You got it. You want me to just read off the questions, and you'll – Yeah, let's go, go for ahead. it. Okay, great. All right, so the first question we have, I'll start at the bottom, because a lot of them may have been answered as you went through the presentation. But the first one is, what happens if you offer an ICRA and no longer meet participation requirements with your group carrier? Well, what what's going to happen is you, you'd no longer be able to submit any reimbursement. So there's that initial verification that gets you in the door. In order for you to stay in the, in the house, in the room, um, you have to continue to – be enrolled and and if if I'm not enrolled then I wouldn't be able to submit any expenses and so that money kind of just sits there and does nothing the question I get often is well does cobra apply in that situation well no it doesn't because there's not a um uh qualifying event there there's no termination of employment it's just I didn't meet the requirements um so but that that's a good question because What's interesting about the ICRA is that there's going to be a lot of the right hand not knowing what the left hand's doing. I mean, you, you've got an individual market out there with no connection to the employer at all. In fact, there's incentive to have no connection, and all of this is going to be interesting, <laughs> to say the least. So, good question. Um, doesn't blow up the plan. No one's going to prison. Uh, just would not be eligible for reimbursement anymore. Next question we have is, if an ICRA is offered to me and I am covered under my spouse's employer policy, does the fact that I have a spouse group plan make me ineligible for the ICRA HRA? Well, that's a good question. Um, the, the requirement on its face just says I have to be enrolled in individual coverage. Um, and so I think in that situation, I've met the requirements and I could be eligible. My spouse obviously would not be eligible for any reimbursements from that ICRA. Um, they may come out and change that. I don't know. I know that question has been asked, but I don't see any limitation in the rules that prevents that employee from being covered if, as long as they have the individual coverage. So. Okay. How does COBRA apply if the class you're adding your HRA premium contribution is all full-time employees? How does COBRA apply? Well, I mean, it, Applies the same way it always applies. I drop to part time, I lose coverage, and you offer me the ability to continue that by paying the full amount. So next one is okay. Well, I'm happy. I mean, I, I suspect there's there's actually more to that question than what it seems on its face. I'm, what you can do, Ross, is collect any follow ups, and we'll do our best to to reach back out. Um, and, I, and frankly, it's hard for me to address these questions in full detail. Um, so we'll, 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 we may – it may be worthwhile to collect all these and even if we try and answer them and then you know, maybe put a, a bit more detail around them. But we'll do the high-level stuff now. So if I don't answer it the whole way that you intended or I didn't understand it, we'll, we'll try and get back to it. Right. Now, do you see some state Dobies passing regs to make it as impractical in their state? i.e. New yes. Jersey? Yes. I don't know about New Jersey. Um, I know there is an effort right now to uh, by, by folks who do not – who want to protect the integrity of the small group market. Um, let me give you an example. California has a law that says – and they're not alone. There are other states that have this. If, uh, if, if you carrier um, – and the way they've – I'm, I'm paraphrasing it, so there's some – but this is the gist of it. If you work with an employer to sell policies to employees, then the policies have to meet the small group market requirements, which they can't do. 
Um, even though the health insurance reform requirements are generally the same for both, there are some differences, and they just wouldn't be able to do that. So it effectively prohibits that. But I don't know when that would apply. I don't know how they would enforce that. Um, what's going to happen here is an employee on its, his or her own goes to the carrier, gets a coverage policy, but then gets reimbursed by the employer. There's not going to be list billing here because of that incentive to avoid ERISA. So um, I don't know. But yes, I think states that are particularly uh, – concerned about the impact these may have on small group market um, could very well do that. Good question. If I have large claimants, let's say, in an Ohio office, and I stop offering group medical to them and provide them with the NICRA, can they say that that's discriminatory? Um, no. I mean, I think you'd wait until the first of the next plan year, but I think you could offer – I mean, that's a rating area. Um, and you could offer it just to them um, and not traditional group health coverage. Could they – could they – if the age, would the agency say that? No. Um, and, and the reason is because I have to be enrolled in individual coverage in order to be eligible for this anyway. And so it's not like they're not having coverage. It's, I mean you could just stop providing coverage, right? I could I'm not obligate under HIPAA's non-discrimination rules to provide any coverage at all. This is just changing the, the form of it, so no. Now, could a participant sue or uh, I, maybe? I mean, they can sue for anything these days, and they do, um, but I don't think their chances of being successful are high. Okay. If an employee is offered an ICRA and waives it, are they eligible for a subsidy on the exchange still? Uh, only to the extent that it would not it was not affordable. So again, that's going to be that's going to be that is a big rub of the proponents of the new HRA rules. One of the big rubs, because you've got your your uh, employee who, frankly, cares only about the job that he or she does, and and his or her family doesn't really, and hasn't followed uh, the whole Code Section 36B affordability process. Now having to to make a decision at the time that they're being offered this coverage, well, gee. Um, I, I need to look at what the cost of – what the monthly premium is for the lowest cost silver plan in my rating area, and I need to I need to take that. I need to subtract from that the amount – the monthly amount that the ICRA could reimburse me, and I then need to take my household income, multiply it by, for this year, 9.86. It's supposed to be significantly higher next year, and, and compare that to what – the amount is I have to pay for that individual policy and determine if it's affordable. Right. This, this isn't going to happen. Um, so that's the big rub by a lot of the uh, proponents is that there's just there, there's going to be so much confusion about whether it's affordable. If it's not affordable, they have to waive it in order to qualify. If, if it's affordable, it doesn't matter whether they um, do or not. Now, again, that actually puts some – onus on the employer, right? Maybe not a legal onus because I don't have to. I can offer it to you and disqualify my entire lot of employees. It doesn't matter. It's no legal issue for me, but something the employer is going to think about, right? I'm going to offer this to my employees, and I might inadvertently be uh, causing them to be ineligible for a subsidy. So, The last question we have is a Medicare clarification with ANICRA, which is if I have a few over 65 age employees, I can now contribute into the HRA account that they use toward the Medicare supplemental premium. And if well, the spouse is under 65, would this be an issue? Well, that, that's, a, that's a loaded question because uh, I can't – first of all, that, that over 65 employee has to be in a class of employees that is offered the ICRA. Right? This was the problem that the agencies had. The rule is everybody in the class has to be offered it if one employee is offered it. Well, some might be enrolled in Medicare, right, like your over 65 employees. Well, I wouldn't be able to – if it were limited just to individual coverage and I couldn't, couldn't integrate it with Medicare, then I couldn't offer it to them, and that would run afoul of that same terms and conditions rule. So they thought through it, worked with HHS and CMS, and said, we, we – we're going to offer you, the Medicare beneficiary, this same ICRA that we're offering the, the pre-65 employee 
who doesn't have Medicare and will make the same reimbursement to you for the same scope of eligible expenses as we do for the pre-65 employee. That's how that's going to work. But you're not going to be able to put in an HRA only for that Medicare beneficiary, especially if you have over 20 employees. Um, so I don't know if that answered the question, but I mean, there, there still are some nuances to that. But certainly, if I'm offering it to everybody in the class, it's going to necessarily include Medicare beneficiaries, and you don't run afoul of these rules or the the Medicare rules because they're in there. So, all right. Any final last words? Ask not <laughs> what you can do for your employer, but what your employer can do for you. <laughs> words of wisdom Thanks. thank you all uh, everyone that participated on the webinar again just as a reminder we will be sending out Ashley's presentation uh, via email sometime this afternoon if not then uh, by tomorrow and if there are any additional questions that come up feel free to uh, email us over at OCA and we'll be happy to get Ashley uh, his guidance involved and, and get you those answers so thank you all again have a wonderful afternoon bye-bye